Welcome to the CNCF End User Lounge, where we explore how cloud native technologies are adopted by end user organizations across different industries and sectors. CNCF End User Community is formed of more than 155 vendor neutral companies that use open source software to deliver their products. I'm Dave Zolotuski, a principal engineer at Spotify. And today with me, I have Rajan and Dave from Fidelity Investment as our guests. In these live streams, we bring end user members to showcase how their organizations navigate the cloud native ecosystem to build and distribute their services and products. Join us every fourth Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. This is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please don't add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. If you have any questions for us, we'll be monitoring them throughout the stream. Make sure to ask your questions in the live chat. This week, we have Rajan and Dave here to talk to us about Fidelity Investments. Before we get into the conversation, Rajan and Dave, could you briefly introduce yourself? Could you briefly introduce yourselves, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Raj Rajan Puripati. Uh, people call me Rajan. Uh, I'm part of an uh, organization uh, called uh, ECC within uh, Fidelity. Uh, within that, I'm part of the cloud platform team. Uh, I primarily work on the Kubernetes-based projects. And uh, the goal of our team is basically to uh, set up the next generation uh, application platform uh, for our users. So uh, to, to put it in like, right words, uh, if let's say a dev developer within Fidelity wants to you know, do something uh, to achieve a particular business uh, objective, we wanted to make it uh, as simple and as easy as possible for, for the developer. So uh, that, that's me. Um, very happy to represent the cloud platform team. Hi, my name is Dave Botello. Um, I've, I'm in charge of the uh, private platform squad within Fidelity, um, where we're primarily focused on uh, building out Kubernetes platforms to run our container workloads on-premise. Um, we have probably around 40 clusters, um, production clusters on-premise of Kubernetes running at one time, supporting uh, a variety of workloads uh, with close to about 10,000 containers. Cool. That, that sounds like a lot. Um, before diving into the Kubernetes part, part. Yeah, I'm sure it feels like a lot sometimes. Um, before diving deeper into the Kubernetes part, I'm curious to, can you tell us a little more just about the infra infrastructure setup at Fidelity uh, and what prompted you to start adopting cloud native tools and Kubernetes? Uh, yeah, I can I can start with that. So basically we, um, we have a mix of uh, on-prem and the cloud. Um, <clears throat> we are into multiple uh, cloud providers as well. Uh, so basically just, just to give an idea, uh, Instead of uh, just setting up clusters and then opening it up for the users, uh, our goal basically was to uh, come up with a platform uh, which is more fidelity specific uh, in the sense that we want all the uh, the best features available from the CNC technologies. We want that to be available for the users. But at the same time, uh, we have some hard constraints from, uh, from an enterprise standpoint. So uh, for example, today, uh, if, if I'm a developer with Infidelity, it's not very easy for you to just go and spin up your own Kubernetes cluster and then deploy an application and take it to production. Uh, you have to take a lot of security aspects uh, you know, uh, that come into picture in terms of uh, your, your image that is using, that is, that's, that's very important. In terms of the AMIs, uh, it, there's a long list. So, and, and this particular list, for example, it, it sort of keeps changing as well. So for example, there could be a security event, uh, not just with Infidelity, but in, anywhere outside that could actually trigger like a, you know, a different policy or change to a policy. So uh, these constraints are something which, uh, as a developer, it's not so easy to keep up with. Um, so we, so the goal that we set out was to actually build an application platform where we take all these constraints uh, into account and we sort of come up with this platform where, as a developer, you get to uh, experience all the features, uh, the best best features from the CNCF technologies. At the same time, you're guaranteed that you are running in a in a secure fidelity environment. Security is one aspect of it. There are, there are, uh, there are other aspects like compliance and a uh, lot of other things, which we'll get into the detail. Uh, but, but that is the goal. As a developer, uh, 
you, sh you should it, it, we, sh we want to make it really really easy uh, so that you know you're able to you know quickly deliver you know the business objectives so we have uh, so Dave mentioned 40 that is more 40 clusters so that's on the on-prem side uh, so total put together we have like EKS clusters AKS clusters uh, on, on AWS and Azure so uh, the total cross is like 300 plus now so we have a dash we have a dashboard uh, sometimes we look at it and it, it jumps like from like one number to another, so I'm pretty sure we have crossed like three ten or something like that. Uh, so, uh, so that's 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 a high level you know setup. Uh, Dave, if you want to add, yeah, I mean infrastructure from an on-prem perspective, um, you know, primarily we're we built out our platform around uh, vCenter, around vSphere infrastructure. Um, you know, for for our on-prem services, uh, there's also a proprietary uh, API platform, which we built on-prem um, that sits in front of our v vSphere infrastructure. Uh, and we we leverage that for a lot of the provisioning of our virtual server instances um, that we, you know, we lay the foundation upon for, for building Kubernetes. Um, so a large portion of the responsibility for um, building out the platform entails also understanding, uh, you know, how the infrastructure works behind the scenes um, and tightly coupling uh, our integration deployments, uh, our, our Kubernetes build outs on that infrastructure. Yeah, and I just wanted to add on the CNCF technology standpoint, uh, use, yeah, Kubernetes, of course, uh, but we do use um, uh, 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 Helm. So uh, Helm is our uh, standard uh, for packaging. Most most of the time when I actually mention something like Helm, uh, so we always have this approach where we don't want to restrict users to the fullest extent. So we, we always have uh, this famous thing um, where it's batteries included, but it's swappable, right? So we do, uh, uh, you as a user, you have an option to switch to something else as well, but like Helm is one of the uh, uh, like most widely used uh, packaging, uh, you know, uh, mechanism. Uh, <clears throat> this platform we'll talk about more in detail, but uh, it's it's kind of like a base platform on top of which you can actually run a lot of things. Uh, so uh, in in that perspective, we have like Envoy, which is running on top of uh, EKS clusters as well as a part of like an API gateway and stuff like that. Uh, so it's like a combination of all all these technologies. Yep, but that sounds really good. Are there other CNCF projects aside from Kubernetes, Helm, and Envoy that you're excited about, or kind of either using now or plan to use in the near future? Uh, we use, uh, yeah, we we are constantly exploring uh, the. Uh, so, almost always, we try our level best to not create something in house. Uh, uh, we we try to look uh, at where the community is going forward, uh, and we want to stick to the community, right? Uh, so uh, almost always we we sort of look at uh, this landscape and make sure that you know we we pick something from the landscape. Um, so in terms of the, for example, uh, we use like some uh, if not full uh, some some components from the Flux uh, you know CD. For example, Helm operator uh, which is part of Flux, uh, Helm controller now and. Uh, now it's I think it's GitOps toolkit, right? So uh, we use that extensively. Uh, we we actually have built an open source project called Cron uh, on top of it. So basically, we, we took these technologies from uh, CNC CNC and uh, built something on top of it just to extend it a little bit to our use case. Uh, and and we have sort of open source uh, that as well. So GitOps toolkit is one example, and uh, Cron is the open source project that we have built on top of it. Uh, uh, yeah, we use Containerd, right? Uh, and and these are the major ones and uh, we are we are always you know constantly exploring uh, you know uh, projects and i think uh, correct me if i'm wrong Dave, on the telemetry side as well we are we are looking at uh, you know fluent bit and you know stuff like yeah, that yeah we use fluent bit for a lot of our log collection um, we also are pretty heavily invested in opa um, so from a governance and compliance perspective so we're using opa to build policies and constraints around uh, you know, how we govern uh, the platform itself. Um, so there's all different types of policies that we've implemented uh, to enforce um, specific pieces of metadata that are associated with namespaces. Um, we're looking to uh, make that migration very shortly over from the native PSP policies within Kubernetes to, um, to OPA to do that policy enforcement. Um, so that's a, just a couple more examples of some of the CNCF projects that we're using. Yeah. 
No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think both of you alluded to or touched on uh, security for the environment. And I don't think you necessarily said it, but I assume there's a lot of regulation as well. So I'm curious how being in such a kind of regulated and required to be highly secure space impacts the way you look at all of this infrastructure and open source tooling. Uh, yeah, so we we have uh, very strict, uh, you know, uh, regulations. Uh, being part of the financial industry, that's that's actually important as well. Uh, so the the way we look at it is uh, that it's very important to have, right? Uh, so we have built the platform in such a way that. Uh, from a user standpoint, for example, today if you if you talk to any of the fidelity developers, they don't look at if let's say they are let's say in AWS, they don't look at it as if uh, it's it's an like EKS cluster or a Kubernetes cluster, but they look at it in terms of like a fid, fidelity platform. Uh, internally, we call it as like fid fid EKS, fid AKS, and stuff like that. So they always refer it to as like hey fid AKS version one. So we have our own fidelity platform versioning. So they usually say. FID EKS 1.0, 2.0, and stuff like that. So coming to the security point, what we've done is we have sort of packaged uh, all these things as a part of the platform, right? Uh, so whenever we sort of make a release, uh, we what we do is like, for example, there are all these add-ons. I'll give you uh, I'll give you an example. The OPA, which uh, Dave was mentioning about, uh, that's something which is part of the Fidelity platform. So from a user, for the Fidelity user standpoint, he doesn't look at it as like one standalone add-on which is running in a cluster, but he uh, or she is basically exposed to the features that come comes out of the, uh, comes out of the add-ons. So the way we try to portray is basically we have this platform and you have all these features that are available for you. Forget, don't focus more on the uh, add-ons aspect of it because behind the scenes, between FIDEKS 1.0 and 2.0, we might actually switch the add-on to something else, or we can combine two add-ons. We will do a lot of things as a part of the platform. But from a user standpoint, they just look at it as a feature. So uh, from this perspective, if you look at it. Um, uh, we sort of built in the security features uh, within the platform so that, uh, let's say, if you are going from one Kubernetes version to another, we sort of have this rigorous process where we we uh, we check every single add-on that is part of, part of the platform. It goes through a, like a, a, as a process to make sure between the versions, between the version of Kubernetes as well as between the version of add-ons, is there anything that has changed that uh, impacts our you know security guidelines? Right? It could be as simple as uh, a a particular add-on version, not com uh, image, let's say uh, base image that is part of this new add-on version, maybe that is not compliant with uh, you know uh, some of the current security policies. This is one one good example, right? So those are things that we will actually validate as a part of our uh, you know rigorous validation process before we release a platform version. So what happens is whenever the users get a notification that hey we have this FIDEKS 2.0 or FIDEKS 2.0 out, uh, most of these things are actually already handled for them, and we do make it part of our internal release notes so that they are aware of like what all things. Uh, Sometimes you have to uh, take a slightly different approach. Where, for example, uh, let's say we want to we want a particular change. It's not in compliance with one of our security policies. At the same time, let's say we do, we, we are unable to get that change from the open source project uh, immediately, right? So those are the cases where uh, we'll we'll sort of come up with a certain workarounds. It could be like for a very small period, a small period of time, we could actually do something where. Uh, We'll, we'll release the feature as a part of the platform version, but at the same time, we'll, we'll sort of do some workaround for a, for, a, for a period of like two months or something like that until the actual change comes from the open source project. So these are the things that we do as a platform team. But from a user standpoint, uh, they're, uh, they're unaware of these things. Right? From their standpoint, you have a feature that is like very stable and you know it is working. Um, yeah, and so what does that make versioning and upgrading look like from a user standpoint? Like you release uh, VDKS N plus one, then right. Uh, so basically, what happens is uh, uh, so maybe a little bit on the fidelity structure. Uh, we are not like one central team which manages all the clusters. So fidelity is a large organization, uh, and we have like a lot of uh, sub organizations, right? Each each business unit itself is, is, is a company by itself. It's like a lot of developers. They have their own dedicated. Uh, DevOps teams, SRE teams, and it's like that. So the way it works is um, a business unit will have a DevOps team, right, and operations team. So when we release it, uh, it's actually uh, them taking the platform version and then upgrading the cluster. It's not as if like we will, we we sort of give the tools in place. We sort of have like a, you know, 
uh, UI where they can actually go and do it, but we don't do it for them. Uh, they have their own timelines and it's, it's up to them. So basically it goes like this. So we release a 50 case version. So we'll have a call. Uh, we have a release call. Uh, and then uh, the users sort of get to see hey, what all new features are coming in, what are all the breaking changes. And then they get to decide, OK, uh, when they can actually do it. We do have a. Oh, we do have a time frame where we, we support like n minus three and minus four version. It's not as if uh, a particular business unit cannot stick with a particular version for a long time. That's there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they sort of pick the version. They actually upgrade the clusters. And if if there are any issues, then that becomes like a platform issue. It's like an issue happening with platform 2.0, and then we sort of uh, you know jump in. And we have all these monitoring uh, you know dashboards and everything set in place. So we. We would know upfront if, uh, if if somebody is doing a cluster upgrade, a uh, platform upgrade, and if something is going wrong, we would we'd automatically you know jump in. So that, that's how it, it works. So from from uh, from a DevOps team member who's actually picking up the version, they might we might have packaged twenty different add-ons within the platform, uh, and each could be in its own version, right? So they're not worried much about it. From their standpoint, they look at the entirety of it as like one single version. Uh, so even if one of the add-ons is not working, let's say a particular feature is uh, you know, not working, so they just, from their perspective, it's basically the platform version is unstable. So we just release like a, 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 a patch version for it, right? Uh, so that, that's how it goes. That, that's, how, that's how it goes, actually. Yeah, so uh, on, on on the private cloud side, on prem, um, so what Rajan was talking about was a lot of what how we manage things out in the public cloud, and large portion of that is self service, right? So the cut the release, they provide the release out to the customer base, and then the customers are consuming it, and then they pretty much have a you know the ability to roll it out on their own schedule. Um, on-prem, we're a little bit more prescriptive over it. Um, we take a little bit more control over it, and it's probably more of a managed offering more than anything. Um, and so what we've been trying to do over the last you know, year is try to obviously keep up with the Kubernetes versions. That's, that's a challenge, right? Um, so this past year, um, we had a target to try to do four upgrades in one year. And so we did four upgrades this this year. What by the end of this year we'll have done four Kubernetes upgrades, uh, with a target of one per quarter. Um, so hopefully by the end of this year, um, and maybe my team's listening, um, we'll get 120 out the door <laughs> by the end of this year. Um, and so that's a substantial amount of workload. That's just to keep up with the versions. That doesn't include you know all the work that we do around. Uh, like add-ons, things that you know Rajan was mentioning around you know, maintaining versions for you know all the different charts that we roll out to support the environment and provide other capabilities. Yeah, I, I, I see a question from Mavuk. Uh, uh, how do you keep up with the upgrading, Dave? If you're okay, I just wanted to touch upon that yeah, little bit uh, because that's something which I, I think uh, some of our learnings could be useful for the users. Uh, so there is this problem, right? Especially when you are uh, uh, multi-cloud. So Imagine we are trying to uh, have a uh, platform which which actually provides certain features. So from a user standpoint, they're looking at this unified platform and uh, that is supposed to run irrespective of where you are, whether you are an on-prem, whether you are an AWS and Azure. It's a very difficult thing to do, especially when uh, if, for example, in, in, on the on-prem side, let's say we are using Rancher, uh, there uh, the versions that Rancher would support will be slightly different from. I'm, I'm referring to the n minus uh, four, n minus three problem, where, uh, for example, one one vendor might say, "Hey, at, at my current is 120, and I uh, I follow the n minus three model. So at any point in time, 117 is the latest." At the same time, another vendor, uh, if you're on the cloud, AKS, AKS, for example, uh, there could be a situation where they are doing 119 and n minus four, so their least supported version is 160. Right. So how do you how do you do this? It's it's a very tricky problem. Uh, so that is where uh, there's no clean solution to it. Let, let me put it that way. So uh, that's where we constantly we uh, uh, the platform leads we sort of meet, and sometimes we sort of ask Dave, for example, to sort of slow it down a little bit where we sort of catch up and stuff like that. But but one thing that we always put uh, in the front is the stability of the platform. Even if let's say 
uh, 120 I'm just taking number 120 has like some really important feature and then let's say one of the teams or some of the teams are uh, waiting for it right if we think that you know we won't be able to provide this uniform experience uh, if we you know if let's say one of the platforms let's say if we say that azure wants to move forward right and then you know do that where uh, you know aws lags behind if that is going to be the situation we really evaluate uh, we, we we try not to do that right we try to wait so uh, stability becomes more and more important than releasing new features. So sometimes we'll actually tell the application teams that, hey, this is a feature that you want, but can you can you live without it for like another few months? Right? Is it like absolutely important? Because that would directly mean that we can actually, uh, the point here is the stability always comes first. So uh, that is one thing. Another thing is, Took some time for our internal users to. It's. it's it, I think it's a mind. Uh, it's. It's a mindset. So, uh, for example, like upgrading. These. Are, these are big clusters, and a lot of critical applications are uh, running in it, right? So, uh, like a year back, when we went back to them and said that, hey, uh, the community moves very fast. Like Kubernetes, if you look at look at it as a project, it's, it's, the developers are like amazing. They come up with all these features like very quickly. So the, the versions move very fast. So. Uh, we sort of release versions as well, right? So it was very, a year back, uh, our internal customers, it was very difficult for them to digest the fact that every two months or something like that, they have to do a major upgrade. Uh, so now if you look at it, looking at how stable the whole uh, thing was, uh, uh, so we have taken it to a point where, uh, uh, it's more of a perception, perception thing, but we have taken it to a point where it's, it's okay to do the upgrade, it will be stable. So building that, sort of a thing uh, is very important so if you can if you can actually put uh, all your efforts towards making the upgrades like really really stable uh, then the users build it there's this confidence that builds in the user right for example if you look at our version uh, you know upgrade validation process every single add-on that we use we have a mix right we use some of the community uh, add-ons a lot of community add-ons and we do have like some of our own custom built uh, we have like a lot of operators we have a lot of operators that we write every single add-on uh, we have a rigorous walkthrough we we, we try to uh, we have like a separate set of smoke test integration test uh, that is very well maintained uh, that will almost always catch if there is uh, an issue that you know, that's mapped to a particular version or something. So there is a rigorous amount of work that goes into validating each of the add-ons that are part of the uh, part of the platform. So we put in a lot of efforts towards uh, the stability aspect of it. So that will in turn, you know, increase the confidence for the users. And then uh, now it's it's a new normal, right? Now now it's a new normal. It's not as if like uh, you know. Uh, no, like sometime back, upgrades would be like few times a year for major platforms, but that's not the case right now. So uh, building that confidence in your user is is, is very important. I, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think I have a question that's kind of building on that exact kind of stability and confidence from the user part. And they're asking about how you make sure that uh, upgrades or updates to any of these components are safe to apply. And on top of that's, that, that's a good point. How do you limit the blast <laughs> radius as you're finding that some might not be safe to apply? That that's a good point. So uh, one of the things that we we do is uh, we sort of have a structure where I know it differs from company to company, but we have to follow an approach where we have certain engineering clusters. We call it as test clusters, platform engineering clusters. So for example, um, uh, I'll give an example. Let's say between a development uh, and a testing. Uh, uh, and the production environment itself like there are usually there are differences in terms of policies and stuff like that. so we make sure that our testing clusters the platform engineering clusters are on all these spaces so when we start out first of all uh, before even going to the platform engineering, everything starts from your uh, uh, local right uh, we have a very strong set of uh, uh, test cases that are very well maintained right so it's it's uh, it's it's based out of cucumber it's a combination of cucumber and all the different sort of things so we have a very strong set of integration test or smoke tests that is very well maintained i keep stressing on the very well, well very well maintained because it's easy to come up with the first set but sometimes uh, like over a period of time you can easily like uh, you know not maintain it very well then it loses its purpose so we use we sort of rely on that which will, which will actually catch a lot of issues and even after that there is a rigorous testing uh, on an environment basis we sort of test it in like platform engineering dev platform engineering production uh, these are efforts but uh, for 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 our scale these are like you know massive for, for for supporting 300 clusters we cannot afford to make mistakes we do make 
mistakes here and there uh, but we do everything possible like we sort of things to do it so that is that is one thing right we have like strong integration test uh, the test suite that is like well maintained we test through every uh, you know environment type and after after that also um, uh, when we release it again this is something where we don't upgrade all the 300 clusters as i said before uh, it's more of the users picking it and picking picking up the release. Uh, so uh, we also try to see if we can actually work with some of uh, the business units uh, who are usually uh, they're they're okay to pick up something first, right? So there we work with them very closely to see if there are any issues in the in the, the development clusters when they upgrade. They they usually start with development clusters. So we sort of monitor that very closely. We have very strong uh, uh, you know, logging and telemetry, which sort of helps us that if somebody is picking up a release and putting it in their dev clusters, let's say that is the first of three hundred clusters that is getting up uh, upgraded, like all our eyes are on this, right? Uh, so we we watch it very carefully. And uh, if we see an issue, then we sort of uh, quickly, uh, you know, revert to it. Sometimes we even, you know, ha it's rare, but we can even like pull out the whole release and say that, you know what, like, uh, it, you know, we'll, we'll come up with the patch fix and stuff like that. So no straightforward answer, but uh, uh, one one good thing, uh, if one, one, one takeaway if you want, I would say maintaining a strong set of, uh, you know, integration uh, test suite. Yeah, and I could add on to that a little bit. I mean, from the, from the on-prem perspective, um, like Rajan said, you know, we we definitely have spent a lot of time building out these test suites, um, unit testing, functional testing, um, and ensuring that we're not just doing this testing, you know, at the end of a release cycle, but we're doing these types of tests all the time. Um, and so, some of the strategy behind it really is around building that end-to-end -end testing, something that we can run on a daily basis, something that is, uh, you know, bringing issues to our attention um, on a daily basis versus, you know, finding out right before the end of the release. Um, I think the second piece of that for us is really rolling out these releases um, in a little bit of, of, uh, of, you know, a canary fashion, if you want to call it that, um, where we'll do, you um, you know, in, in our area, we have uh, multiple zones and multiple regions. We'll do one at a time from a non-production perspective. We give our business partners adequate time to cycle through that environment, ensure that they've, you know, maybe deployed workloads multiple times, uh, become comfortable with it. Um, and then subsequent scheduling of of the upgrades uh, to our production clusters happening, you know, during tech windows, you know, during times when uh, there's the least chance for impact to our production running uh, workloads. Um, so that's a lot of the method behind the madness, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I, there's another question on the chaos engineering uh, stuff. So I want to take that. That's a very good question. So we have, we, we have, we've been using, uh, we've been doing the chaos engineering stuff uh, since 2021, uh, early 2021. Uh, but the, the point I want to stress is, even two years back, I, I, I remember very clearly, even in 2019, right? We we made sure that, for example, let's say we want to add a feature to the platform, and the feature comes from a particular uh, community maintained add-on, right? So there are cases where the community maintained add-on might not have like a Helm test. Uh, you know, a, a, a testing associated with it. So even when we bring that in, we make sure that before you can plug that into the platform, you have to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, add add your uh, you know test case to it. So uh, we we run Helm test against all the add-ons. So there is no add-on that can actually go into the platform without a test case associated with it. We also take it a step further. So um, uh, we have this open source project called Cron, where we came up with the idea of uh, something called layers. So uh, what happens is basically you have a collection of add-ons, right? Uh, so look look at this case. So we have clusters running in Azure. Um, AWS and then on-prem, right? There are certain add-ons that runs everywhere, but there are certain add-ons that runs only in the cloud, which is like AWS Azure. And there are certain add-ons which runs only in, um, you know, uh, uh, on-prem, for example. So we've came up with the idea of uh, something called layers. So what we did is we packaged all these add-ons in terms of layers. And for example, we have the security layer that is shared across these platforms. And we have this cloud layer, which is only on the EKS, uh, AKS side. So the, the reason I bring up this layer concept is, even in 20, I mean, even even like two years back, we were very clear that each add-on should have a test a test associated with it. And this layer, which is a collection of add-ons, which is closely related, will have like an integration test uh, associated with it, which is basically another Helm chart. So imagine a layer which has like five add-ons. Uh, each is a Helm chart. So each Helm chart has a test. 
and uh, there'll be the, uh, the last uh, add-on in the layer, which is a Helm chart, which basically does the integration of all those add-ons. Uh, th these were significant efforts, but it paid, off, paid us off really well in the long term. So Helm test is extremely important. Even if you're picking up a, up a community project which, which doesn't have it, uh, you know, please uh, you know, add, it, uh, add that to your uh, list. At the same time, uh, uh, you know, come up with like an integration test Helm chart, uh, you know, uh, that can actually validate like how certain add-ons, how, how they work together. I'll, I'll give an example. For example, as a part of our onboarding process, right? So uh, we, we created an extension to namespace called namespace groups. Uh, so the users typically, they, they're not exposed to namespace. They, they always start with something called namespace group. So uh, as soon as you create a namespace group, uh, there are certain things that happen. So uh, your your AD groups are automatically, you know, created. Uh, there, there, are, there are certain things that happen and it's, it's basically a work done by few add-ons together. So there is like a, an integration test Helm chart, which basically checks this particular thing, right? So uh, yeah, these are some of the things that, you know, we have, we have been doing like even from the beginning. At the same time, recently we have uh, early 2021, starting early 2021, we have uh, started focusing a lot on the chaos uh, engineering stuff. So we, that that's part of our suite as well. Yeah, and, and the chaos engineering aspect of it, right? So, you know, we I think that we're dabbling in that right now. I have, you know, I have definitely looked at, you know, um, integrating chaos mesh into some of our pipelines that, would not only uh, handle, you know, building, you know, building these these clusters, uh, running through unit tests, um, but also knocking things over, um, you know, and then ensuring that the platform continues to function as as we expect it to. Um, so um, we're still, from my perspective, we're still at the beginning phase of that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then. For the specific tests, I think there there's kind of the question about chaos engineering, but also postmortems and things. Do you do things, do you have ways of ensuring that times when it does go down or you do run into issues, that doesn't happen again? Like how you bring that back into your testing frameworks? Uh, yes, yes, that 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 actually happens. So let, 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 let me think about it. So basically, typically what happens is like when we, um, uh, when we, when we, we, we sort of prioritize our, it could be an obvious thing, but I think that's something I just want to stress upon because it really works well. Uh, we we prioritize stability over features. Uh, that's 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 that might sound obvious, but it's something which is very very important. So if we release a particular version and then let's say at the same time we are we are working towards this next immediate version with a lot of new features, if we find there are certain things that we have not done wrong, uh, it actually feeds back and then uh, we sort of focus on that first before uh, the next the, the new features. So. Uh, 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 the reason I say it's obvious thing is uh, it, it takes effort uh, when, when you bring that back, when you discuss in your, uh, you know, sprint meetings and stuff like that, this is given like, you know, very high importance. So uh, I think it's it's part of our, uh, maybe, I don't know, it's a, the team culture now that we have to focus more on the stability. I think if you have like a small team with few clusters, then it's a different thing. But especially when you are holding uh, all these like, uh, you know, 300 plus clusters for like you know thousands of developers and a big organization like Fidelity, uh, stability comes first. So we sort of immediately take that and then uh, you know put it back to our uh, you know sprint to make sure that the changes are done to the the, the test cases are enhanced and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, that I mean, added on to that, Rajan, I think that like it's pretty much ingrained into our Fidelity DNA that root cause analysis is the de facto method for us coming to conclusions of what needs to be fixed, right? So, um, I mean, my team is very well versed in the fact that, you know, when we find problems that we need to come to that root cause to understand how we can resolve that so it doesn't happen again, so that our application uh, partners don't run into these types of problems down the road. Uh, so, yeah, we spend a lot of time uh, tracking, <laughs> um, trying to ensure that we are opening up stories and 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 understanding uh, when we haven't figured things out, you know, that we get back to those and we drill into those things. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, we were talking about some of those things this morning before we <laughs> lucky enough to join your uh, your your uh, broadcast here. So, yeah, and, and maybe this is an important question, right? So. 
we, we sort of look at things in a slightly different way. So for example, let's say if something is happening on the customer side, right? We do have three different environment, which is supposed to mimic uh, the customer environment, right? In terms of like security profiles and everything. But, so if, if there's something that they are catching, we are not catching, we sort of try to look at uh, why this difference came, right? Which means like some, uh, there's a mismatch in terms of like how the environment is configured versus, uh, you know, us. So we even try to look at the process that, the fundamental process that was actually broken so that this can actually occur. So we sort of go and fix that so that not only this problem will not happen again, but like many such diff uh, types of problems will not, you know, uh, you know occur. So uh, like we sort of go down to that level where even if it's like a uh, fidelity specific process, which is like, uh, you know, very basic, we, we, we try to, you know, push to make changes or automate that in such a way that, you know, uh, so we basically try to go analyze the, the base, not just like on a high level, why this happened, uh, not from this one particular problems perspective, but uh, to an extent where how do we uh, prevent not just this problem, but similar types of problem uh, from occurring. Um, for example, one example is it, it happened maybe a year, couple of years back, but uh, the way our uh, IAM roles were managed in AWS. So we even like uh, took a big step and came up with our own framework based on stack sets and stuff like that. So we changed the whole process. Uh, it was it was a lot of effort to actually do that um, relatively. Uh, but now when I look back, that is one of the important thing, things that we did. So we, we changed the process. Uh, we had to get a lot of approvals because that was like already a hardened process. But we made, we sort of got the approvals, approvals and we changed it. And now after that, like, We've not seen uh, not just that issue, but like in, in that that space is like very stable. So you have to go to that level uh, if, it, if it makes sense. Yeah, no, that that does make sense. Um, I guess one more potentially quick thing on testing before we move along. Um, you talked a lot about testing, and it sounded to me like you were talking a lot about testing the Fidelity platform, like pieces that you've built. Um, I'm curious if your automation and your tests also catch potential issues in the tooling. Like if there's a change in Kubernetes that breaks something for you, does that get caught here or is there a different process for catching things like that? No, it's it's baked in actually. So for example, even if we bring, so the the, the integration test piece that I talked about, uh, so even if we bring a, it, it includes test cases for the community and it's not just our stuff. So uh, sometimes we actually go and uh, raise issues up front. Um, uh, and you know it benefits the you you know the community as well. So it 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 actually uh, you know involves all the Kubernetes stuff as well as the community add-ons. Cool, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so then I just wanted to take a bit of a step back and hear a little more about the overall architecture. I mean, you've mentioned a multiple clouds and you've mentioned three hundred clusters, but that's about as far as we know. So I'm just curious to kind of dig a little deeper. How big are these clusters? What sort of yeah. things are you running in them? Are they multi-tenant? Just all of the kind of typical things you think someone would ask about how your clusters are organized. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'll start and then I think Dave, Dave you can also jump in. Uh, so uh, most of our clusters are in the medium size range. Medium size in the sense, uh, I don't think it has more than 75 nodes or something like that. So it's not like thousands of nodes, not, not, not for sure. At the same time, uh, it's not small as well. So most of them fall in that range. Uh, everything is multi-tenant. So that is one of the key things that uh, we decided back when we started in 2018 until we uh, decided. So there are a lot of processes built along to support, built around to support the multi-tenancy. So one of the examples was stuff that I was uh, mentioning earlier around extension of namespaces. So uh, uh, for example, when, when a team onboards, uh, instead of just mapping it to a particular namespace, we sort of created uh, an entity around it. So uh, every team, when they actually onboard, they, they get like something called an NS group. And uh, so that is a Kubernetes aspect, but there is like fertility specific aspect in terms of like how, how does it get integrated with the, uh, so for example, how does the AD groups get created, right? Uh, so you have to, uh, you, you cannot autom automate half of it and not the other half. So uh, these are things that we did. So everything is multi-tenant. Uh, uh, so in terms of in terms of the number of teams, it it, it, it sort of varies, uh, but like easily you could, you could find like 50 to, you know, 75 teams working in a cluster. I'm talking about a team of, you know, let's say eight or something like that. Uh, and they cannot step over each other. There are uh, there are frame, frame, frameworks built around resource code as limit ranges and stuff like that. For example, the NS group concept, it sort of includes uh, a section for the resource code. So as a, as, as a cluster admin, I can actually say this team gets this NS group with certain resource quotas and stuff like that. Um, so which means the team themselves can actually go and add and delete namespaces uh, within that NS group, but it is actually bound to a particular uh, 
you know, a set of constraints. So uh, it is it is, it is multi tenant. Uh, so most of them follow the typical approach of having a cluster admin, and uh, usually there is less dependency on the cluster admin. What I mean by that is you go to him for the initial stuff where he sort of onboards you and sets the constraint. After that, we try our level best not to create a process where you have to go to the cluster admin again and again. Right? So, um, so it's mostly they're self, uh, you know, uh, independent. Uh, we, we do have pipeline set up, but uh, pipeline is something which, uh, you know, sometimes it can become opinionated, so they can actually bring their own pipelines. So most of them use uh, their own pipelines, deployment pipelines and stuff like that. Um, so that's the, uh, that that's on the cloud side, Dave, if you want to add on. Yeah, from the on-prem side of things, um, again, you know, we've adopted or, or prescribed to the notion of smaller clusters. You know, Rajan mentioned medium-sized clusters. Um, you know, initially, you know, the thought behind it was maybe we'd go with logic clusters, um, but ultimately it comes down to blast radius. Um, and we've learned that, you know, the, the automation that's involved with, you know, maintaining maintenance around these rehydration, um, it, it gets lengthy, right? It takes a lot of time to rehydrate a thousand nodes. Um, so by breaking it down into smaller pieces, we're really able to uh, create decision points where we can decide if we need to move on with other clusters, if say we ran into a problem, um, or if we can, um, you know, just continue or, or stop dead in our tracks and revert or hot points, so to speak. Um, so, you know, the smaller clusters, multi-tenant, mostly business aligned. Um, so a lot of our clusters are specifically business unit aligned um, so that it creates that separation between our business partners. Uh, and then within those clusters, they're, they're definitely multi-tenanted where um, all the different development groups are working within that cluster separated through many, you know, namespaces. Um, and in non-production, um, we see a lot of those namespaces uh, delineated by their various development cycles, right? So, you know, development, sit, bit, you at, <laughs> and, and for the most part, those non-production clusters tend to be on average um, at least two times larger than our production clusters, just based on the number of workloads and in the various environments for them to cycle through uh, application development before they get to production. From an architectural perspective um, on-prem, I mentioned earlier that we're predominantly on vSphere. Um, and on top of that, we front front all of our clusters with Avi load balancing services. Um, and those that Avi load balancing service sits, you know, pretty much as a, an L4 uh, proxy down to our either the ingress in, nginx ingress controllers, um, which handle that path-based routing. Um, and then also, we uh, uh, allow them to also use like node port ranges, right? So that they can um, do direct uh, pod traffic. So, um, yeah. Cool. So that spurred a few questions. Um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, sorry. Go the, the big thing here is just around uh, monitoring and observability of your clusters. Like, how? Do, what tools do you use? How do you kind of collect metrics, logs, traces, all of the normal observability things, and how do you monitor the health of of the workers? Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, I think there's one question on the ownership of the cluster. So, uh, so basically, as I said, um, the business unit. Uh, are, are our internal uh, clients, right? So basically, we sort of provide this platform uh, and, and certain, uh, it's basically a framework with a collection of tools to manage it. The ownership of the cluster is actually with uh, the business units. Uh, so the platform ha def has defined its own set of rules. So there's something called uh, the global admin, uh, platform admin and stuff like that. So business unit, uh, they will have like a, you know, DevOps uh, SRE team. So they'll actually be the, 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 the cluster admins. So we do have, uh, you know, uh, 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 like overall access, but uh, they are the actual cluster admins. So in terms of upgrades, if there are, for example, let's say if uh, you're having issues with the resource quota and stuff like that, so that's how, uh, that's where the, the users actually go to. So that is the ownership of the uh, cluster. And and basically the ownership is sort of divided in, in this way. Uh, when we, Whenever I say platform, end of day, it's a collection of namespaces. It's it's more than that from a from a Kubernetes standpoint. It's a collection of namespaces. So if you open up a 
uh, uh, Fidelity, you know, cluster, you have all these set of uh, management namespaces and system namespaces. So anything with hyphen system is a system namespace, like similar to Coop system where all these critical add-ons runs. And then we have a collection of management namespaces where all these, uh, right from cluster order scalar to ingress control, all these things run. Those set of things put together as a platform, uh, any issue happens there, we are responsible for it. So uh, the cluster admin, like, doesn't even have to look into it. They, like it straight away comes to it comes to us because it's a platform issue your platform is unstable um and anything other than that let's say if uh, there's an issue with a particular resource code a limit range within an user namespace uh and that's where maybe the cluster admin will will come into picture other than that like we have the name we have another role called namespace admin so uh if if i'm the owner of the namespace group right uh, i have a collection of namespaces i'll have admin access to that namespace which means like i can i can do whatever i want uh you know within that uh uh, for example, let's say I'm I'm trying to install, let's say, uh, some sort of a CRD-based uh, operator, right? So uh, there is a, like a, a, a particular automated process where you can actually go and submit where uh, a particular add-on within the uh, platform will sort of create the the customer source definition for you. From then on, you're 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 on your own. So that's how we have sort of uh, done it. So uh, coming back to the monitoring strategy, we basically have. Uh, it, it's actually a mix, mix, but we have a combination of Datadog, uh, you know, Splunk, and like you know stuff like that. So we have uh, a, a collection of very good collection of pre-built, uh, you know, dashboards. So at any point in time, when you have 300 clusters, right? So look at it this way: each cluster, uh, each cluster has this collection of namespace, which I said is a platform. So within these 300 clusters, if the platform is unstable on any of these clusters, we'll, we'll get to know. So, uh, so that, that's how we have actually set it up. So from our standpoint, we just look at a particular platform version. When we release platform version 1.0, uh, we just, we, we, we know what all clusters are upgraded, what all clusters are not upgraded, but any point, we, we would get to know if platform 1.0 has issues in any any of the clusters. So we use Datadog uh, in combination with Splunk and we have all these pre-built uh, dash, uh, dashboards. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, and we, we use like uh, metrics heavily, metrics logs. Uh, traces is uh, some of the, I think some of the community projects have it, some of them don't. Uh, even like our internal tools that we've developed, uh, we, I think we're still in the process of uh, making uh, the best use of traces. So it, I think we're, we're getting there. Uh, so in terms of monitoring, again, I think that's separated. Any platform related come to comes to us, but anything which is like application related, it goes to the namespace admin, and then if it is um, uh, anything on on the on, on the other side, it goes to the cluster admin. So that's how we have sort of separated it. So if let's say an application team has uh, an issue with their deployment, then it doesn't come to us at this point. Uh, I just wanted to touch upon a little bit on this on something which we are actually working. Uh, just, just to uh, you know, maybe it's used for the users. Maybe they can actually think along these lines. Uh, let's take this problem where you have these deployment pipelines, right? So at this point, if a deployment is having an issue, um, we, we have an SRE team. It comes to us sometimes, but most of the time, usually what happens is if I'm a developer, like mid-level developer with four or five years of experience, I usually go to the uh, team lead first, and then team lead will actually go to the business unit DevOps teams, right? So uh, what we are trying to do now is sort of as a part of the platform, right? We are trying to actually come up with another, uh, uh, you know, sort of a system where, uh, imagine this, this is the this is what we are trying. So you have a Jenkins pipeline, for example. Uh, imagine we give you a Jenkins plugin where anytime your Jenkins build fails, it prints out a link and you click, click on the link, it tells you what the problem is, right? So that is something what we are actually working towards. Uh, hopefully we'll actually open source it. Uh, we are trying to, you know, uh, build some machine learning models and then, uh, you know, do some, uh, some some analysis or on top of it to actually come up with these things. The, the reason I mentioned that is now we are actually trying to uh, take it a step further in such a way that each developer who's actually the user of the platform, we are trying to focus on the pain points they have uh, and then try to, you know, solve solve that. So I just want to touch upon that a little bit, but I think going back to the monitoring again, maybe Dave, uh, do you want to add something on it? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the questions that was on the board was how do you monitor worker health? Um, so, I mean, we do have some, you know, basic, you know, things for workers that just ensure that the virtual machine exists and it's responsive. Um, that's really just basic monitoring, but 
the monitoring itself really comes from Datadog, right? So the Datadog monitors that we've set up are specifically looking at the components within the clusters, right? So for instance, you know, if you kubelets down, well, then your, your, your node is not going to work, right? So from that perspective, the health of that node is inoperable, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not functioning. So that's kind of how we prescribe to it. So a lot of the monitors we're writing that we've written are really around like those service component health, at, at health status. Um, from a logging perspective, like he, he, he mentioned real briefly was, you know, we do use Splunk. Um, we have kind of a mixed bag of logging. Um, we use Datadog in some areas, we use Splunk. Uh, we, and we also uh, have a team internally that has uh, built out some really interesting architecture around like an aggregation tier around FluentD. Um, so basically our Fluent bit log collectors that pull the logs off of the nodes uh, will push those logs to uh, a FluentD aggregation tier uh, and that aggregation tier then pushes those again to Kafka topics. Um, and then those Kafka topics are read by Elk, right? Um, and that's how we were able to kind of use Kafka as a, you know, almost like a traffic manager, right? Where do I send logs for these specific clusters? Because there are different requirements that come from business lines around where they want their logs to land. Um, so. Um, yeah, I hope that answers some of those questions. Yeah, and I just wanted to add some something uh, to it. I, there was a question on the uh, how do you monitor the worker health. Uh, I think the agents, the Datadog Splunk agents that we have has these by default, but I think on top of that, we have deployed as a part of the platform, one of the add-ons, if I'm not wrong, is uh, the node problem detector add-on uh, from, I think it's part of the Kubernetes project itself, node problem detector. So I think we are, we are sort of using that, that actually helps as well. Uh, but I just wanted to mention one problem uh, which, we, which we have, right? So uh, today, uh, look at it this way. So let's say there is an application deployment that failed, right? And it and if you look at the logs, it'll say Helm release time down. And if you if you run kubectl uh, get pods, it'll say pods pending. Then you will figure out why the pods are pending. Then you'll see your nodes are unstable. Then you'll figure out like why the nodes are unstable. It'll be something to do with cluster auto scaler or like something happening on the network side that is affecting the AWS auto scaling groups. There is like a chain of things. So uh, one of the pain points that the developers have today is uh, when something like this happens. Uh, even with the current solutions, uh, if even if we set alerts, if you open the mailbox, you have like a flood of alerts. So uh, it's not as if like someone tells you that, hey, all these problems are happening, forget about it, just fix this one, right? This is what you need to focus on and then everything else will, will happen uh, automatically. So this is a problem that uh, we, the project that I was uh, mentioning earlier based on AI, uh, AI and machine learning and stuff like that, that this is something which you're trying to solve. When a deployment fails, when they click on the link, you want to tell that, hey, there is this network issue happening and your auto scaling group is having an issue here. Someone is working on it. Don't worry about it. Rather than spending a list of commands, which basically, so that's sort of a, a correlation analysis. Uh, these are things that even, even though we have a pretty sophisticated monitoring setup today, these are problems that we still have. Uh, and sometimes like, uh, let, let's say there is like a network outage going on that is affecting a lot of things, right? From a developer who's just looking at a Jenkins pipeline to for him to get that information, it takes like hours. Sometimes he, he raises a ticket, uh, someone has gone for lunch, they come back, they look at it, they raise something in the team's chat, and then somewhere they get to know that a network team is working on it. This correlation, uh, but but if you look at it from the, the way we are platform team, right? But the way we look at it is they are users of our platform. and this is a platform uh, you know, uh, experience. So we want to enhance that. So uh, we are sort of investing, uh, along with the existing monitoring and stuff like that, we are sort of investing in, in our efforts around the area where how do we use the latest ML techniques to sort of make this better for them. Uh, and the question was, how, do you, how does one differentiate between logging and tracing? So as I said, we, uh, uh, most of the add-ons, I'm not sure if they, they do a uh, like lot of tracing. Uh, at this point, most of the thing, most of our monitoring starts with metrics, uh, and then from metrics we sort of try to correlate uh, to logging. Uh, we, we, we have seen that whenever you have tracing, that is the best thing you have. Right, you start with metrics, that's where you get the alerts. Then you go to the trace, and then you get the logs. Uh, 
but uh, uh, yeah, at this point, everything starts with metrics, and then it sort of uh, you know goes to the logging. But some of the latest stuff that we are trying to do based on the machine learning, it's actually reverse. So you sort of start with the logs, and it's it's you know it's, uh, interesting. It's for the future, but that's one thing uh, we have been doing. And the question was around um, what is the component the master that actually reaches out to the Google API. Uh, I, didn't get, get that. So basically, uh, in terms of the communication between the control plane and uh, the Kublet, uh, uh, that sort of differs from, uh, you know, for example, EK is slightly different from, you know, uh, you know, a rancher. Uh, how do you do inter-cluster uh, networking? That's a very good question. Yeah. Honestly, that is one of the. That is one of the. We still have that as a pain point. Let, let me yeah. tell you. That. Uh, so it's it's not a problem that we have solved. We are working on it. Um, there are uh, you know, uh, solutions that we are still looking at, but I can say that's a problem that we have not solved. Uh, Basically, yet. it's still we're still using you know external load balancing services to to handle inter cluster traffic. You know, we we haven't come up with any type of uh, a solution to that, like a service mesh or anything. Yeah, nothing like a global you know service mesh or anything like that. It still goes out, comes through the uh, load balancer, and then comes in. Yep. Yeah, so the, the, the NY stuff that I mentioned, NY stuff that I mentioned was, uh, so there are there are things that is getting built on top of our platform. Uh, uh, so so we have 50 case, right? So we have all these, for example, uh, there's like an ML platform that we're trying to build on top of 50 case. So similarly, there's like an AP gateway that gets built, built on top of uh, our, uh, our 50 case. Uh, so the Fidelity platform that we've built over a period of now, like when I look back over the period of two years, whatever we have done, it's so now it's like a solid foundation where uh, like people uh, can actually build on top of it. So internal clients, one of the businesses that can actually build uh, the layers concept that I talked about earlier. It's basically a collection of items. They can actually now contribute and say that, hey, I have this machine learning uh, you know, set of uh, features available. I'm packaging it as a, 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 as a layer, applying on top of your platform that becomes like your uh, Know, uh, ML platform. At the same time, it's an ML platform which, is with all the fidelity constraints, you know, uh, you know, set to it. So uh, the Envoy stuff that I mentioned was around those lines where uh, there's like an AP gateway that is actually getting built on top of our uh, platform, and that is where uh, you know it is actually used. Well, so we're just about out of time, but yeah, if you can, if you can get through the last question or two. Yeah, I think this is something which maybe if it is like even two hours, we can. I think we can. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, exactly. Networking at cluster to uh, cluster or part to part. Uh, we do have uh, teams using uh, you know Calico within our clusters. Um, we stick to uh, at least on the cloud side. I think uh, maybe Rancher, Rancher it's different, uh, but on the cloud side we stick the uh, the native uh, CNA drivers. We don't use overlay, um, at, at least at this point. Um, so uh, we have teams which this is something which we don't enforce, but uh, we have teams which uh, basically uses. Uh, uh, they can actually install. It's it's not part of the platform yet, but they can actually install Calico on top of our platform and then uh, do the network policy and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, we're using we're using Canal on prem with overlay networking in the public cloud. They do not use overlay. Yeah, and as I said, cluster to cluster is still something which uh, goes out and then comes through the ingress. So uh, we don't have any you know, global service mesh or anything like that at this point. Yep. All right, that makes sense. I guess with that, we can we can wrap up. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today for this uh, for this episode of the Cloud Native End User Lounge. And uh, it was great to have both of you, Rajan and Dave, on to talk about Fidelity. Uh, and we had some great interaction and great questions from the audience. And um, we bring this end user lounge to you on the fourth Thursday of every month at about 9 a.m. Pacific time. So hope to see you the next one. And don't forget to join us for KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, North America, October 12th through 15th to hear the latest from the Cloud Native community. And also, if you'd like to showcase your usage of Cloud Native tools as an end user, join the end user community. And there are a lot more details on cncf.io slash end user. And again, thanks everyone for joining us today. And we'll hope to see you next time. Thanks for having Thank us. You so much, Dave.